Feliz, Feliz Navidad. This is a very special happy hour because Santa is here at the bar. Just kidding. He's not here, and he will get the presents there on time. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Diamond, along with Eric Bowling and Cody Willard. And this is where we're going to show you and to tell you how to cover all your financial bases for the new year. Make tons of moolah in 2009. And how about just not lose tons well, of moolah in good, 2009? Yeah, good start and build from there. Uh, trust us, folks, it's possible, seriously, to make some money next year. We've assembled an all-star lineup of money mavens. Let's welcome to Happy Hour, Danny Babb, real estate rock star and author of The Accidental Landlord. Welcome back to Happy Hour to John Rutledge, chairman of Rutledge Capital. He could be Santa Claus with all the money he has. <laughs> and uh, Matt McCall, president of Penn Financial Group. All right, everybody, let's kick off our first topic. This is what we're going to want try to get the best answers from you guys. The best way to make money next year, whether it be stocks, mutual funds, 401ks, we know we all need help there, ETF, bonds, housing, something, something, John. <laughs> make us some money in 2009. Eddie Murphy said uh, uh, politically right now, you too can be a hoe. Because this is... <laughs> The, the economic markets are broken, but the political markets are alive, which is why you make money in Caterpillar now, because Caterpillar makes money off the trillion-dollar infrastructure spending. Same thing's true in China and elsewhere. But also next year, you make money by knowing the markets are broken. There are too many opportunities. There are time bombs. If you pick the wrong one, you're dead. So stay with what you know how to do. Don't eat out of the other dog's bowl, because you don't know how to play the game for the other guy. So stay in the sector and in the stocks that you understand. Always sage advice. Lobo and I, we don't share bowls. I don't go near that place when he's eating. <laughs> but uh, to talk to us a little bit, you know, this year, everything seemed to trade in tandem. It didn't matter what asset class you were in, they all got crushed. Is there going to be any asset class that is safe next year, or are they all going to trade in tandem again? <laughs> I think they'll probably all trade in tandem again. Yeah, I'm really looking at buying low, selling high in the housing market. There are some fantastic deals out there. Um, particularly in the jumbo market, if you can get financing, and also, you know, you can you can buy products that maybe are a little difficult to get in the United States and sell them on eBay. So that might be another good thing. Something from Cuba, perhaps. Might, you might that. Be a good option. What about it, Matt? Yeah. You're the stock guy here on the table. Um, if Danny's right and, and the housing market looks good in 2009, is that is that what really the stock market needs? Do we really need a, a strong housing market for it to, to rally next year? Yeah, for a sustainable rally in, in 2009, you're going to need a housing market first to bottom and start working its way back up, and that's going to lead the stock market higher. I believe when I was asked this question, where do you put your money? I think ETFs next year. I think stocks next year. Actually, I think some junk bonds and some corporate bonds right now are trading cents on a dollar, bringing in 10%. So I think 2009 is a year of opportunity, and even the housing market, like Danny said. I mean, there's opportunity regionally in housing as well. So I think right now, the best thing you want to do is take your cash and start putting it to work in 2009. And, you know, it's funny that you say that because just over the past few weeks or in recent history, very recent history, everybody's putting their money in treasuries. I mean, John, they're willing to take zero or even a negative return for the first time ever in treasuries. When you guys are all here saying there's a lot of opportunities out there, people, what, what's going on? What am I missing here? Well, what's going on is people are scared to death. They got even more scared in September and they started hoarding cash not only investors, but also consumers. That's why sales are down. That's why jobs are going down so badly. But treasuries are very dangerous right now. In the short term, you can make none. But if you crawl out the yield curve and try and catch a little bit of yield, you can get killed by a falling price when the rates go back up. And, and, and touch on that also, well, even if it's uh, not a price thing, inflation. If inflation goes up, you're going to get killed even worse. Right? Yeah, that's going to be the next story. I spent last weekend in London with $20 billion worth of guys whose first name begin with Al. And we were allocating money all around the world. We were looking at 15% current yielding first mortgage pools. We're looking at buildings selling for 30% of their replacement cost with an 8% cash yield what, unlevered. What was that this time last year? If it's 15% today, what was it, 3 to 5% last year? 18 months ago, you were looking at 3, 4, 3.5, 4, 5% cap rates on buildings in New York. It was overbid. You were looking at hedge funds taking money. So don't get in the hedge fund business right now. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about time horizon because it's not just about 2009. This show is all about slow money, and that's what we're looking at over the next whole five year. to 10 years. Right. Right. That's nothing, right? I mean, we're in all seriousness, yeah. 365 days is the blink of an eye. We're talking about the next 3,000 days or the next 20,000 days. What, from that time horizon perspective, 
Does it matter? Do we buy stocks? We know they're down 40, 50 percent, even if there's going to be another 20 percent decline. This is the time to buy if you have money sitting on the sidelines, but you have to be very careful with what you buy. You need to make sure that, first of all, you know the industry, you know the company, but there's a lot of money to be made in the volatility. I mean, I've been having a blast with the volatility intraday, and while I wouldn't recommend that for the long term, it is it is something that you could use day to day. Can you gain that some. in over time and even over Absolutely. the next year? Do you, think you feel comfortable that you can gain the volatility intraday? I've, I feel I can maintain it, and I feel like Point I can Point of order, maintain. though, Danny knows how to do this. Yeah. Most people don't, yeah. and most people time. day trading can really just give their money back. So you really need to go with where you've got a skill today. Amen. Yeah. Okay, so, Good. you know, Matt, a lot of people are going to be at home with their families, you know, this ho long holiday weekend. You know, aside from that, they should really spend some time before the end of the year taking a look at the 401k. Absolutely. What do you recommend? Where you know, uh, maybe some people have already hit that 15,500 contribution limit that's uh, you know sheltered from the taxes. Come January 1st, they're going to start reinvesting. Where do they invest? Number one, they should be investing because I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten over the last two months saying, should I take everything out of my 401k? Should I stop putting money in the market? This is the exact wrong time to do that. Dollar cost average, put more money into the market now if you can. So number one, keep putting money in your 401k. This is the time you're averaging down. That's, that's key. And also, think about this again. Like Cody said, this isn't investing for 300 days. You're not retiring in 300 days most likely. It's going to be thousands of days down the road. And longer term, this is the opportunity. It's the time you're putting money in the stock market and be diversified. I think as a long-term investor at home, if you have a 401k and you have 10 different options, get some international, get some small cap, get some large cap. But succinctly, cap. it's all about the slow money. Exactly. Lock on. It's awesome. also right. about quality. Quality. Only Always by the top. The quality. Only by the top quality. Uh, this yeah. is another topic that we really want to get all of your thoughts on, the bailouts. You know, it's been a big topic that we've covered uh, all year, the latter part of this year. Um, how are they going to be viewed at the end of 2009? So, John, we're basically here. Right. This time next year, look. What do you think the bailouts are going to be perceived positively, negatively? One year from today, Cody's going to be saying this was the greatest thing that ever happened. <laughs> oh come on! <laughs> no, look, that'll never happen. There's a political class in America. One year from today, they're going to think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Trillions of dollars floating around. They'll grab their piece of it. Some of them, like our friend the governor of Illinois, may go to jail because of it. But political class is happy. The markets, okay. The Fed has finally delivered reserves. It will have an effect sooner or later. The markets will go up. So they'll be okay. In the long term, though, we have disabled markets. We've killed the price system. This is not good for growth, not good for productivity. Well, what, what you... No, I'm not going to like it. And a lot of people who think longer term won't like it either. What about the Main Street crowd? You talked about the uh, political class, the Wall Street crowd. What about the Main Street crowd? Will they like the bailouts? The Main Street crowd is going to be noticing that the recession has just begun. It's not over. It's only after September, when people got so puckered up, that they stopped spending. So we're looking at a lot more job losses. By the end of 2009, sure, it'll be better by then, but there's a lot of water to tread between now and then. Matty, the, the, the infrastructure play in 2009, when Barack Obama becomes president, he's, he's told us he's going to spend anywhere between, I think of the low end was $700 billion, and the upper, upper end could be into the trillions. What's the play? On that spending, the bailout money, the stimulus plan, what's the play, the infrastructure play you like best? I, I, you know, I look at look at the engineering, because you, everything needs to be engineered, whether it's the water, whether it's the highways and bridges. I get a company by the name of ACOM. It, it's, a, it's a worldwide global uh, engineering infrastructure play. And my biggest play of all this, which really hasn't been touched on too much, X2 of them, one's power grids. Think about the rolling blackouts they have in California. That's something I think that's going to be the future that we need to look at. And water. Look at the water infrastructure here in New York City. I mean, there's water pipes blowing all the time. They've been underground for 80 years. They weren't meant to be there for 80 years. That's all over the place. Chicago, that's the other big play. Danny, I'm going to go on record just not to confuse anyone. I guarantee I will not be looking back at the politicization <laughs> of the trillions of dollars that have been sucked out of the private profit-seeking market and been put into, as John said, <laughs> politics, it's going to be a disaster this time next year. I can't see how it works out until we get back into markets. You're right. There are lies, damn lies and statistics. We all know that, right? So all of the little bailout bunnies and all the bridge loan bunnies are going to say this was a fantastic idea, and any minor recovery that we see, they're going to say it was as a direct result of the bailout. If you're on the opposite side of the fence... You know, there was a, on the other network, they had one of their high-profile guys. The day that the bailout package was signed and Mark was up 500 points saying, thank goodness this worked. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. A little premature. I don't think anyone would make to draw that conclusion. Uh, you know, but yeah, as Danny touches on, 
uh, regardless of, you know, we are going to be a little bit better. Things will improve a little bit just because of the nature of time. Time heals all wounds, but right? But I think things have it changed is, longer term. Yeah, and, you know, people will say it's because of the bailout. You know, it, there's no really way to know if it's because of the bailout unless, as John's saying, longer term than just a year out. Well, there are statistical models that we could use that, that are, you know, too complicated for this, but... Freaking that cool. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Basically, those can be formulated to say whatever the person who formulates them wants. Absolutely. You know, the, I think the key here is, um, you know, we, we have to look at the fact that the market's going to recover despite the bailout, not because of the bailout. Well, and that's, that's really saying, the bottom line. We don't know that for sure. No one knows that for sure. We know. <laughs> we do know. <laughs> we do know. <laughs> we do this every time yeah. for a living. Oh, no. Let's talk about this. Right. Like we, we referenced the, the Treasury yields going negative at one point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is actually a little bit of a silver lining, right? We have uh, foreign central banks pumping money into our Treasury Department, loaning us money to, to for the bailout. whatever for bailouts. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, fact number one, central bankers are idiots. They try and target interest rates. It's a stupid way to run monetary policy. Only because the Fed abandoned that in September have they finally delivered reserves. That's what's going to lift us out of this. In the UK, they did the same thing. Rates down, they're going to go with what they call quantitative easing, which is what Japan did in 2002. So the central banks have all cracked, given up on their ideology, and are dumping money but, in. But, John, then you're saying, okay, the central banks don't work, and they're not uh, they're setting the interest rates correctly. The market doesn't work right now either. So it, we're just going to let it free fall and let, let the market take over. The, market the markets do work. It's just right. going to be at a it's lower price. broken right now. We were talking about electricity grids. Everybody knows that from time to time, grids fail, and it goes dark. We call it a blackout. We are in a blackout of the capital markets right now. That's why the bid-ask spread for assets is like this, and that's why you can't transact now. That's why I said earlier, you can make a killing on a top-quality asset from a troubled seller right now. But you can make what looks like a little more from a lousy asset that will kill you. See, and so only, only, only buy the Pfizer in the industry. Don't buy the low-hanging fruit with the big yield. Yeah. Only buy Caterpillar if you want to buy equipment. Don't buy the bad company. And so forth, all down the line, real estate, stocks, bonds, mortgage securities, whatever. Because yeah, John's right. What happens is the best of the breed gets pulled down with everything else. There's nothing wrong with Caterpillar, but the, everything's getting sold, the hedge funds are selling it, and that's when you have opportunity. That's when you have to be stepping in. Because you look back five years from now, we're sitting here, you say, wow, I could have bought Caterpillar or Fives, whatever stock you're looking at. Yeah, yeah. At this price, you'll probably never see again. I, 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 I want to caution those guys. Beachfront hotels are never empty. When we're talking right. about cyclical stocks like Caterpillar, you want to sell those stocks when they look cheapest. And they're sure. trading at a 3 PE right yep. now. The time yep. to buy it was five years ago when it was 500% lower, but it looked very expensive. I'll take the other side of the trade. Yeah. I'll take the absolute other side why, of the trade. Why? Because they've, they've been beaten up so badly. Right. You see any rebound in housing, like Danny says, you're going to see the whole that whole sector spin go back, money flowing back into Danny, the Caterpillars. Oh, Danny, yeah. okay. we, I, I love Matt and I love Dr. <laughs> Rutledge to death, but you've got those stockings on Christmas Eve. <laughs> final word. What do you want to leave us with here? It's just coming back. But final, final word for this block, I mean. Final word for this block is look at some strong assets that have to do with building infrastructure, like you were talking about with Obama's plan, but on the telecom side. So look at the Cisco's and the AT&T, some of those big players that have yeah, long one I'm working on right now. Yeah, and, and they're, they're building like crazy. They're building like crazy. <laughs> All right, everyone, that was great. Great round. On tap, we've got the ultimate round of quick shots as Matt McCall and John Rutledge give us their best picks for the new year. And Danny's back with her recommendations for housing in 2009 when our Christmas special Eve, Christmas Eve special edition of Happy Hour continues. Okay, thanks so much. Hey, I've got Danny Babb with me here for some tips for surviving and thriving in real estate next year. Danny, it's, I think, one of the most important questions out there. You know, the guys are talking about the stock, people are talking about the bailouts and so forth, but people are concerned about their homes. You know, do you think that this market, the housing market, is going to recover in 2009? I don't think we're going to see a full recovery in 2009. I think we're going to see very specific areas. Real estate is always local. We're going to see very specific areas start to price stabilize. Those are the areas that have had low foreclosure rates all along, like Texas, Idaho, Washington State, and so on. I think we're going to see exceptional bargains, though, in the places that boomers are moving to, which provides a potential opportunity for those that are willing to hold out for the long term. You know, the the problem that I see there is that, you know, it's, it's 
that, that whole where if you do want to sell your, if you do want to buy a house, you know, mm -hmm. say if I use myself for example, you know, I want to sell my apartment and buy a house, you know, with a backyard and everything. Okay, well, it's going to be tough for me to sell my apartment so I can upgrade in and buy a bigger house and I'll, as well. How am I going to get a jumbo loan when the credit markets are going are still frozen up? Is this still going to all be a problem next year? I think we're going to continue to see this be a problem. Right now, we're, we know that the, the banks are taking the bailout money and they're keeping it as reserves. They're not really lending it. Unfortunately, that's that's not going to help housing recover. What is helping, however, are people dropping prices and actually realizing that their homes are not worth the 800,000 that they thought they were and taking the right down and just you know, now that they don't have to pay taxes on on that that loss. So that, that forgiveness that, right. the government, that the bank gave them uh, and taking the right down and just selling it at what it, its true market value is. Yeah, but then you you have to make sure you have enough money for a 20% yeah. down payment because right. before people were relying on selling their homes for a bit of a profit yep. and pushing that money into buying a bigger house, moving up in the world. So you're gonna, that, that's also, I mean, I, I, what is going to finally then break this stalemate? I mean, what's going to yeah. finally help the housing market recover? Is it going to be some of these uh, programs that the government wants to do uh, at interest rate at 4.5%? No, it's artificially low. And we already know that people with the teaser rates that, you know, had, say, 1.5%, they, they had a new rate set to them, uh, given to them under a loan modification program at maybe 45 or 5%. They're already defaulting again. That's not what's going to fix the problem. It's just going to take some time to work out through the system. And unfortunately, we're going to have to see a lot of people lose their homes. We're going to have to let the foreclosures work their way out of the system before we're going to have any level of price stabilization. Right. And you touch on a really good point because, you know, everybody's talking about these loan modification programs, folks. And, you know, as Danny was mentioning, there are some numbers out there saying if the banks do modify a person's home loan, they're in, in risk of foreclosure. Well, three months to six months later, it's about a 50% that they're in uh, facing foreclosure again, that they're defaulting on their loan. So basically, they're not able to pay this loan, even if it's modified, the interest rate is taken down. They're, they're, either they're having job problems or they've got credit card debt. They have so many financial problems that these loan modifications aren't working. The loan modifications are not working. And we also know that, for example, the HOPE NOW program helped about 100 homeowners, uh, and not what the government has actually ha ha had indicated, you know, a million plus people. Um, what the, These write-downs, unfortunately, if you had a 1.5% teaser rate, and let's say your rate shot up to 8%, you're unable to pay that 8%. So the, the bank comes in and says, you know, we're going to drop it to 5 You still can't pay 5 On top of that, if they don't reduce the principal, you really don't have much other than wanting to keep your home. A lot of people are buying and bailing. They're buying a new home and letting the other one go back on purpose. People who do have some extra cash at home, yeah. if they're not, you know, taking the guys up on their advice and, you know, quick shots and buying stocks, Right. Do they then dabble in real estate where they can, they say, hey, there are going to be a lot of people renting mm -hmm. because they're losing their homes. Yep. Let me buy some really great priced properties for the long term, rent them out. I can put a good down payment and get a good interest rate. Would you advise that? I'm doing that myself. I advise a lot of people to do that. You have to be very, very careful about what you buy and who you buy from. The best deals right now are actually in the pre-foreclosure market, right before the bank takes the home back to get a little desperate. The, you can actually work out a deal where it's in the best interest of the buyer, the seller, and the bank, and even work something out where the existing owner maybe gets to rent it back from you for a year or two. So they get back on their feet, and it's a win-win. So definitely. Okay, you mentioned the key word there, <laughs> foreclosure properties. You yeah. know, the people who are saying, hey, I want to get a good deal. I, I have the money. I want to buy maybe for in a rental property or their own home. How do we find out about these foreclosure properties that we could potentially get a great deal on? I use Realty Track, um, Realty and then TRAC.com. Uh -huh. You can actually go in there, type in all of your search criteria, it'll email you daily, and it emails you the status of it so you know when it goes to, into the into the notice of default stage. Also, title companies will send you an email update for free. Most of the title companies in your area, those are the best places. Okay, and how do we find one of those title companies? Just look up the big one, one in your area? area? Exactly. There, there's a, reputable a few ones. out there as yeah. well. Okay, so uh, you said reputable ones. Mm -hmm. Scams. Yes. You know, this big is problem. a big, big problem. Mm -hmm. They have to be very careful about that. Absolutely. In many cases, they're asking you to sign over the deed to their home and they'll, they'll say, okay, you pay me a small amount of money when the home rebounds 
I'll give you the home back, and you can pay me the difference because you'll have equity. You'll be able to get a home equity line. Home equity lines are dead for a very long period of time. Don't fall victim to those scams. It's, it's really sad because they're actually preying on the elderly and people who maybe don't understand the paperwork, who speak English as a second language, and taking advantage of those people. Are there any legitimate foreclosure assistance companies out there? The only one I'd touch is the government, the gov government. government's Hope Now program. Or, or yeah. turn to your bank and try to work something with them. Directly with the bank is the best. You know, stay away from the attorneys. The attorneys are like sharks right now. I mean, I'm getting letters and there's nothing in default saying, if you want to go into default, we'll help you get out of it. It's ridiculous. Danny, yeah. very great stuff. Thank you so much. Look at how great the New York Stock Exchange looks on this Christmas Eve. The markets are closed Christmas Day, everyone. Welcome back to Happy Hour. This is a very special Christmas Eve presentation. We are here helping you make some money next year. Save your or, or as money. Cody says, not lose any money. And this is our, seriously, our gift to you. Free financial advice. So make it good, guys. And take it for what it's worth. Here is our all-star panel, John Rutledge, chairman of Rutledge Capital. If you follow this guy, you could be as rich as he is. Matt McCall, president of Penn Financial Group. Ditto there. And uh, Danny Babb, real estate rock star and author of The Accidental Landlord. Okay, now we're going to put everyone on the spot and get some hard targets, some actual numbers for the Dow. NASDAQ and housing by the end of 09. All right, predictions, Matt. Where, where would the Dow be? The NASDAQ Dow. and housing. I think Dow, we're looking at 10,800, which is, doesn't sound like a lot because we were much higher in 2008, but it's about 25% move from where we're ending. That here. sounds like a lot. I'd be happy with 25% move. And from the bottom, it's going to be about 35 to 40%, which is typically the type of rally you get one year after recession ends from the bottom, which I think will end this year. So I think, it's, historically speaking, is good. Uh, S&P, about 1,100. NASDAQ, about 1,900. Again, around 20 25% for the year. Okay, and then housing, you're predicting, will oh, bottom in 2000. I think housing will bottom um, regionally. And I, and I think I'm actually looking for real estate in 2009 in Manhattan, believe it or not. And I think in Manhattan in 2009, in the next six months, and Danny knows this better than I do, I think it's going to be a great opportunity to start putting some money to work. Okay, Danny, your okay. next prediction. All right, Dow 11,000, pretty close to uh, my, my uh, partner here. Um, NASDAQ 1,500, S&P 900. I, I think that we're probably going to see another 10 to 12% drop in housing across the board if you're looking at just an, a standard index. Particular areas, local areas like Texas, for example, I think we could continue to see small marginal increases. Okay, we'll get to the guys after, but let's hear uh, Mr. Rutledge's predictions. Well, 401Ks are now 201Ks. Yeah, tell me about start. it. Uh, this is going to be 12K for the Dow, so I think you've got a good bump there because of all the various reasons we've been discussing. I, th I suspect that means the 1300 on the S&P, uh, NAS maybe up 20, 25, maybe I think probably less than the Dow on, uh, for the in for the entire index. And housing, if you can go out and find the right asset, you can double your money next year. But you've got to find, like I said earlier, I know a building in New York, Class A. Almost all occupied, 8% cash yield. You can hold it forever, no debt, selling for a third of replacement cost. That's a slam dunk no-brainer, but you've got to get in there and do that deal. You've got to know the market to do it. This is not by the index real estate market. This is a sharpshooter's market. D Danny, uh, what about uh, there are specific markets? You said across the board you think it's going to be fairly flat for the whole year, but are there specific markets that will tip your hand as to a recovery in housing? Is it Miami? Is it California? Which one's the most important to you? Okay, for long term, if we're really talking, you know, the 3,000 day mark, I think that we need to look at where the boomers are moving. Uh, Florida, Colorado, for example, um, Nevada, Arizona, California, the Sun Belt states. In the next year, I'm looking at Idaho, I'm, I'm consistently looking at Texas. The mid part of the country is holding stable but not growing rapidly. There are areas in California, if you can get in, Orange County, some parts of Los Angeles County that are doing well. There are some parts to stay away from Riverside and San Bernardino County, San Diego County not doing so well. It's really, really local. Eric, Rebecca, throw out some targets. Housing, I hope, uh, doesn't recover until the end of 2009 to give me time to price. Well, you, you and Matt, you and Matt are yeah, going to buy no, housing, no, and then it recovers. No, but yeah. Yeah, Danny and I were talking in the previous segment. It's just you know, like people in in this situation where you need to buy, you need to sell what you're living in now in order to take advantage of these great prices 
So people are going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to sell and maybe just break even on what I bought a few years ago if I want to take advantage. So the prices that we're seeing right now in real estate, folks, there are some great deals out there. Because usually you have low interest rate and high home prices, or you have, you know, the reverse. Right now we have the best of both worlds. Let, let, let me throw something out here. I, eventually all this stimulus and all this money that's being thrown at the housing market, all the different various markets, um, I, I really think that there's an opportunity to make some money by buying an ETF, a housing ETF, XHB. It has uh, many of the major home builders in the United States. If you do see some of that money, see, interest mortgage rates are coming down. Whether or not they actually turn into loans is another question. But if that loan starts to work, if that loan machine starts to work, I love XHB. You, you, you have a cross section of uh, home guys. I'm going to throw out there the the idea that we have again socialized what used to be very profit driven markets, especially in housing. Uh, Five trillion dollars worth of mortgages at Fannie and Freddie are now owned by the United States government, no longer profit driven, totally politically driven. Housing will not bottom until the government reprivatizes well, it. The, the and that's another has three to five years. That they were not nationalized. They were creating a bubble that has now popped after seventy years and they nationalized those losses across the entire spectrum. And for the record, let's hit the, the, the stock markets. I think we'll be lucky to be flat from 8,800 this time next year, but throughout 2009, I will be buying stocks slowly but surely because 3,000 days away in 2019, John, I'll be making money. Something to think about here, Cody. My buddies in the hedge fund business that are that are traders would much rather trade against the American government than against Carl Icahn or George Soros. You've got the big elephant in the bathtub now. There's an opportunity here to play this for the opportunities created by these government meddlers. They're diddling in the mortgage market. They own preferred stock with the agencies. We don't really know quite what the rules are for that yet. As the rules change, you get big spikes in prices up and down. So there's, I think there's opportunity. It's not good long-term for the country opportunity, but you can trade against Uncle Sam and make money. Tough, tough. I don't know, guys. Be careful out there no matter what in 2009.